I'm so excited to welcome our first panelist of the 2020 CNPS Yerba Buena Virtual Native Garden Tour, Amber Hasselbring. Amber is an artist, naturalist, educator, garden designer, and dear friend to the Yerba Buenos and Bay Area naturalist community. Her nature-themed artwork has and does grace BART, the Angel Island Art and Ecology Festival, the Mission Greenbelt, and Tigers on Market Street projects. As Executive Director of Nature in the City, she provides direction for projects, staff, advisory council, and strategy. Since 2006, she has helped shepherd projects such as the Green Hair Street Corridor and spearheaded the SF Plant Finder. As founder of Wild SF Gardening, she designs and maintains gardens for private Bay Area clients. Amber, thanks so much for being here today. Let's give a big welcome and loud virtual applause to Amber Hasselbring. Thank you so much, Eddie. I really appreciate the warm introduction. Uh, it's so nice to know that you're all out there. I see 127 participants on right now. So welcome everyone. So glad that you're joining us and happy Mother's Day again. I'm so grateful to CNPS for um, pivoting in this way and making this available to us. And to all the gardeners who submitted images and have worked so hard on their beautiful spaces to incorporate natives and wildlife into their lives in such an intimate way in their own private gardens. And so Nature in the City, we've been around since 2005 and our mission is to connect everyone in San Francisco to nature by cultivating and conserving local habitats. And just last year, we incorporated my business, Wild SF Gardening, into Nature in the City. So we are offering fees for service programs where we help you design, maintain, and steward wildlife in your own backyard. So if you want to reach out, please feel free. And also, we're doing Q&A during the presentation, so Eddie's going to interrupt me and let me know if you have any questions. So we know that this is kind of a more of a live format. So, and your questions will be contextual. So if you have anything that comes up, just put it in the chat bar and I'll be happy to address that. Okay, so biodiversity starts with native plants. A lot of you know this, but this is just the tiniest insect on a poppy in Sunset Boulevard and this is uh, Cooper's Hawk in Sue Bierman Park, right in the heart of downtown, eating a rat. <laughs> so it all starts with native plants, the biggest to the smallest life we have in the city. And uh, native plants are the foundation, and then next come insects. And this uh, Sunset Boulevard planting was started with just a layer of cardboard, a layer of mulch and wildflower seeds and uh, it went from having nothing to having such a diversity of insects like 10 different insects during a five minute uh, survey so it's really wonderful and i just want to commend you for all the work that you're doing to bring wildlife and the diversity of life to our city and all the work that you've been doing on public lands and all the things that CNPS does and all of our organizations together create a st st such a strong network. So really pleased to be part of it. I'm just gonna go into some of the wildlife photos. Here's an Anna swallowtail caterpillar munching away. And here's an umber skipper butterfly on a sword fern and a beautiful soap plant close up in flower. So we all love the gorgeous images that we can see and the moments that our gardens will make available. Here is a checker bloom and the butterfly that lays eggs on the checker bloom, West Coast Painted Lady. And here was a fun spot. This, was, this photo was made in Hayes Valley and it's a Western fence lizard right down in the heart of things. So it's pretty amazing what you can see if you are looking for it. Here's a red-tailed hawk. They nest, Eddie told me yesterday, they're nesting uh, near uh, on the Twitter building at uh, 9th and Market. So 
it's a pretty special thing that we have that in our city and that we are working so hard to make space for that. So the first thing I'm going to go into, because native plants are the foundation of our ecosystems, and we live in a city, nature in the city's work really focuses on volunteers. So during the last economic downturn in 2008, Nature in the City became an all volunteer organization. And one of the things, um, I don't know if you can see her, Deidre Martin right there in the front in the gray sweater and the glasses. She is uh, the one who really started, started us off with the Backyard Natives Nursery Network. And she decided that growing plants was probably the most important thing the organization could do during the time when we didn't have any staff, paid staff on board. So she found a way to gather people, <clears throat> collect seed, raise plants, have them raise the plants in their own backyards, and then outplant them in public habitat sites in the winter. So it's been a really rewarding program and we've had that going on since 2008 and we are, we are actively raising hundreds of plants every year with volunteers like these that you see here. Our home base for our nursery is at White Crane Springs Community Garden near 7th and Lawton, kind of near Garden for the Environment there. And we have, uh, that's where we start our seedlings and get our plants ready. And then when we get them into one gallon pots, we usually give them to volunteers to raise at home. So volunteers will come and pick them up and raise 10 to 50 plants, however much space they have and what, how, how they want to contribute. And then uh, they, they water them over the summer, do a little bit of light trimming, we train them, and then uh, they bring them back to habitat restoration sites in the rainy season and we plant them out. So it's a wonderful program and uh, it creates an inexpensive way for us to do our work and then also for volunteers to learn about the benefits of native plants in their own backyards and how to participate in the seedling to propagation experience, which is really fun. So we see Matt Slatinich here. He was one of our early uh, instigators along with Deidre. And he has, he raised hundreds of small plants in his backyard and he's gonna be sharing his backyard with you later. I look forward to hearing that. You see a volunteer here starting the seeds in the four inch pots. Then you also see Liam O'Brien up there. Many of you know Liam very well. He's a dear friend and a great inspiration to me personally. And he is also in Matt's backyard helping out. And then Sarah McConaughey, she's there with the watering can. She uh, raised hundreds of plants of various sizes in her backyard in the Sunset District. And here she is with her green hair streak butterfly tattoo. We'll go into that program a little later. Uh, I think we had about 100 or 150 coast buckwheat plants in the van we rented to uh, transport plants from her backyard over to the habitat restoration sites. And finally, the next step is planting with volunteers. So uh, right now it's a little tricky, but uh, in normal circumstances we have hundreds of volunteers sometimes joining us every month, different habitat sites around the city, especially in this one in the Green Hair Street Corridor. So uh, it's a really rewarding time of year to get out there and plant. So the Green Hair Street Butterfly Corridor. This project is our long, longest standing project for nature in the city. It was really spearheaded by Liam O'Brien. And um, this iridescent green butterfly is about the size of a nickel. And uh, its habitat was uh, vanishing year by year, uh, spot by spot. So uh, our dear friend Barbara Deutsch let Liam know that there were still green hair streaks flying out on a particular park in the Sunset District in the Golden Gate Heights neighborhood. And um, he went up and surveyed and in fact he found a butterfly on Rocky Outcrop Park. He took he made field sketches and he took notes. And then um, we were really talking about corridors a lot at that time. So we decided we'd try it out. We plant the butterflies, nectar plants and host plants and other upland dunes, San Francisco native plants and see what we could do. So uh, in the, on the leaf picture there, you see a tiny caterpillar 
in that front leaf. So that is, that's the very early caterpillar stage of the butterfly. So this is all in the uh, Golden Gate Heights neighborhood. We have more than 11 sites there that we actively maintain. This is what the sites looked like before we got involved. Ice plants and weeds and a lot of um, weeping sand <laughs> and trash, debris. And this is what you know, they look like afterward. Not, not all of them have tiled staircases, but this one does. Thanks to just thousands of volunteers over the years, many hours, and many people raising plants. This is a caterpillar in the later stage on the coast buckwheat, which is its larval food plant. The plant the adult female lays eggs on, and the caterpillar eats the fuzz of the leaves first, and then moves on to the flowers, and then drops below the plant, makes a chrysalis, and emerges in the early springtime uh, during its flight and mating season, and then starts the cycle over again. And you know, many people think all butterflies migrate because of our wonderful monarch story, but most butterflies are very localized. This one flies only about 200 feet away from its original habitat. So small sites can really make a big difference for the longevity and the biodiversity of a place. We have also seen some surprises. Uh, this is an Ackman blue butterfly, pretty common, but we also saw an Eastern tailed blue butterfly in the sites uh, last spring. And we've seen over 350 different uh, birds, uh, reptiles, amphibians, other insects, bees, and plants in the corridor during a bio blitz we did there. These are fiddlenecks that actually we didn't plant, but the native seed bank stored them for us and they've come up really strong in one of our sites, which was very exciting. This is in uh, Hoover Middle School, a habitat behind Hoover Middle School, which has been really wonderful that Kids in Parks has helped to bring about. This is Rocky Outcrop, a site that was saved by early founders of the Yerba Buena chapter of California Native Plant Society. This site uh, is host to an incredible amount of lichens. Uh, this is where Liam found the first green hair streak that started this project. And this could have been dynamited and made way for homes on top of it. So we are so incredibly fortunate for all of the um, advocates that have come before us to preserve and protect these spaces. And for the volunteers that keep coming out to do hard work, like working in the rain <laughs> to restore wildlife. Yeah, at the beginning, I mentioned backyard gardens and wild SF gardening's work. And we work with uh, many people, some people who are just, you know, adore native plants, like this person's garden, Kim Marcus. Uh, he has a columbine and this beautiful yarrow and penstemon and every kind of native plant packed into the space that he can. And uh, it's a pleasure to work with people like that. And it's also a pleasure to work with people who uh, really love the ornamentals and then want to attract more wildlife into their spaces like hummingbirds and butterflies. So we work with people wherever they are and we try to bring our knowledge and our local native plant connections into the mix. So we really shop as much as possible with Sutro Stewards, which you'll hear from later today, and Literacy for Environmental Justice Nursery and also Bay Natives. So we try to stay as local as possible when we, and also the California Native Plant Society, uh, Yerba Buena chapter, when they do their sale. So there's a lot of great resources for us in backyards. And these are also more from Kim Marcus's garden, yellow bush lupin, yarrow, and penstemon. Uh, this is in the Sunnyside neighborhood. Uh, this is also Angelica, Ladybug, and another Columbine. There's so much beauty in life that you'll see when you start planting natives that becomes highly worthwhile. These two are different uh, frog ponds that people have built in San Francisco to support the Sierra and tree frog. This is a one and a half inch to two inch frog that has found its way despite all the development to persist in San Francisco 
and we uh, included this one on our nature in the city map and this is just uh, an excellent example of resilience in the city and it's been really succeeding with all the habitat restoration they've done in the presidio um, i'm seeing some some questions maybe pop up so if if you want to stop me at any time please feel free and i'll answer I'm just not quite sure how the technology works, how I can read the questions. So, Eddie, please uh, stop. Yeah, me. no, people are uh, putting in lots of uh, great comments, but there's been no questions so far. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Sure. All right. Yeah, so one of the stories I heard this winter with our various heavy rains is the Sierra tree frog has been just singing and singing and singing in the Presidio. So during those rainy winters, you'll hear the males in large choruses. So I encourage you to go out if you haven't. Here is uh, Peter Brastow's backyard. He is the founder of Nature in the City, and now he works as a biodiversity coordinator for the city of San Francisco. And his backyard is in Coal Valley, it has uh, ribes and coffee berry and buckeye, willow, silk tassel, and just a huge variety of natives, along with the ornamentals that were existing in the, in the yard when he moved in. So we have the great pleasure of maintaining that garden. And this garden is a backyard of uh, Alyssa Pun, who is our stewardship coordinator for Nature in the City. She's also worked for Ledge. And the, she's got a very color lupin, mugwort, poppy, and she's in the Sunset District. So she's got her sandy soil, but what an amazing meadow that you can create if you uh, are willing to plant for biodiversity and native plants. This is another of Kim Marcus's garden. So we have white Douglas iris, California sagebrush, uh, hummingbird sage, grasses. So I think all of you know this, but I'll just mention that it's the variety of color, texture, bloom time, grasses, flowers, annuals, perennials, trees, you know, the more diversity of shape, texture, color, flower time you can have in your space, the more diversity of life is possible. Public spaces. So nature in the city uh, since 2005 has been primarily focused on public spaces and that has not changed at all for us. We uh, so love to advocate for public space and the wildlife that's there and how we can enhance and what we can do to shift. So this is our Western Tiger Swallowtail project on Market Street. We have called it Tigers on Market Street. <laughs> so this one, as you can see, has some tiger stripes. And this is also in Sue Bierman Park, right by the tall buildings and tall poplar trees. So we like to celebrate the stories and the habitats that we can make possible and that others have, been, have made possible in public spaces. This is uh, in a schoolyard garden uh, near the Haight, it's Chaparral Clematis and California Lilac blooming together this spring. So fantastic. Uh, this is a California Buckeye, which Liam O'Brien likes to say is the, the gas station for every si sort of size of butterfly. Blooms in the summer when uh, they're most in need of nectar and there's most butterfly diversity. And as you can see with bees and butterflies, when you have a flower that has hundreds of blooms on one stalk, they, uh, they get a lot of resources for nectar and pollen there uh, and water, especially water. Each flower holds a little water cup for every bird and every, all the wildlife go to plants like this because. Amber. Yes. Can, I, can I ask a couple of questions from the audience sure. here? Yeah. Uh, one audience member, Olivia, wants to know if Nature in the City is doing any work or consulting work on Bernal Heights. Uh, we are not doing any work on Bernal Heights, but we are always open to consulting work. Um, we have consulted on various projects over the years, with one that we're, we're thinking about in Potrero Hill about serpentine habitat and another kind of corridor connectivity project. So reach out to us and we're happy to talk more with you about that. Thank you, yeah. So there's also uh, some other more technical questions here. Okay. Uh, uh, are all mugworts safe to use in brewing beer? 
Oh, this that's, is, I don't that's know a fun the question. answer to this. <laughs> that might be a good one for Sutro Stewards because they have their annual beers and their brews and native plants tour where I think brewers make make uh, beer from different native plants to flavor it. Um, but yeah, Perfect. we'll I, ask Millie later on. Me. <laughs> <laughs> good question, though. Yeah. All right, should I continue? Okay, I'm going to move on for now. So, yeah, just more incredible wildlife shots. This is also public space. This is a black tailed bumblebee heading toward the Ceanothus. So, as you can see, if you spend some time in the springtime when Ceanothus are blooming, you'll see hundreds of, of bumblebees on it and honeybees. So, there's such a rich plant for the early spring insects. Here's a couple as street trees. You'll see a lot of these as street trees. These are younger ones. So it's always exciting to see when residents plant sidewalk gardens or street trees with natives and front yards. Um, the more that we can do to showcase the beauty of these plants and how they can be designed, the more people will see them and get comfortable with them because we, you know, we have a lot of non-native plant options and we're, we're very social beings and we, we see the things that we see, we find beauty in it and the options that we have available to us are really important. So we love all the work that you're doing. We wanna help continue that as much as possible. This is a public space, the Golden Gate Community Garden. We got a contract to take care of this living wall. And this is also where Greg Gar has his native plant propagation site. And um, we've been able to find plants that really do well in a vertical garden space. So you'll see lots of seat monkey flower here, column, western columbine, bee plant, uh, tons of yerba buena and strawberry. Uh, so we've just had a really fun time. And some ferns, a lot of the polypody ferns work really well here. We've had a lot of fun to uh, just see. Also, we have. Um, Lanicera coming out, Lanicera hispidula, the creeping honeysuckle in here. So there's been a lot of life and fun that we've gotten to create here. Uh, sun cups and coast poppy, also public space. Here's our Anna swallowtail. This one has a little bit of a damaged wing, but so very beneficial for wildlife, as we know. Those caterpillars from, I don't, I don't know how many of you heard, have heard Doug Tallamy talk, but he talks about the benefits of native plants, the benefits of them attracting caterpillars and how many birds, you know, how much birds depend on caterpillars for their, their survival and the feeding their young, that protein layer. So um, insects transform the plant into protein, which starts to feed the birds and really fuels the whole ecosystem. A Amber, can I mm -hmm. ask a question from the audience? Sure. Wilma is asking, where is the living wall that you showed? Oh, sure. Go back to that. So that is at uh, Frederick and Arguello, and it is a community garden. It's right at the edge of Golden Gate Park, and it is unfortunately locked, but oftentimes there are people inside that leave the gate open because it's a it's a community garden where you have to get on the list to get a garden plot, but there are people in there most of the time. So if you come by during, you know, a nice sunny day, somebody will probably let you in or the gate will be open and you can come in and enjoy the space. You can see the living wall um, in Pacific Heights at the school. There's a school over there. Drew School. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great one that has a lot of sticky monkey flower and it's a, what is it, like three or four stories high? So that's a, yeah. an awesome one. I have another question for you. Someone okay. from Santa Clara wants to know if they can grow plants for nature in the city. And Absolutely. We have, uh, uh, Alyssa is, is our coordinator for the Backyard Native Plant Nursery Network. And she would be happy to help you get started with plants. So you can go to our website and you look for the Backyard Natives Nursery under our projects. And uh, you'll be able to see information about how to get started there. 
and we also have nursery days uh, as soon as we can start gathering people again we have our nursery days on the first sunday of every month at the white crane springs community garden so those we have also on our website on the calendar and then on meetup but for now we're, we're working remotely with with volunteers to do what they can um, and we're just uh, we're making videos available and describing making maps so that people can still participate during this time and Amber, there's a couple follow-up questions on the living wall. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, is the living wall regularly irrigated? Yes, it is absolutely regularly irrigated. It has drip irrigation. And you can see at the top of that photo that there's some PVC pipes. So the whole thing is PVC pipe runs the whole perimeter. And then there is, uh, there's irrigation pipe that runs uh, into every pocket. So we had a failure in the irrigation system and it really failed. So it, it does need regular water. We actually water this once a day for uh, 10 minutes because of pressure. It's the right amount for the space. It definitely takes some fiddling and getting to know how much pressure you have and, and how, you know, what's needed. But um, with the right conditions, it really thrives. And a slightly more technical question, what material is needed to support a living wall? But I suppose that could be a long answer. <laughs> yeah, this one, uh, it's got, a, it sounds like it looks like a steel gate to me with um, chain link. And then this one we've used woolly pockets. I think they have another name now, but they're made with felt. And these have lasted more than 10 years. They have not ripped or failed the, the things that failed were the zip ties <laughs> they're attached to the wall structure with zip ties and we uh, had to take out well, the old zip ties just broke because plastic breaks down and we reattached them um, we, we might want to try something even more durable but it's been amazing to see how long the pockets themselves have lasted thank you mm -hmm. That's all we've got for now. Okay, great, great. Oh, well. and, and please let me know how I'm doing with time, too. I think we're close to finishing up. All right. You have 20 minutes, so okay. you're, you're, take your time. Great. We're okay. enjoying it. We're loving it. Okay, great. So this is a Townsend's warbler in an oak tree. So uh, if you can plant, if you have the space to plant an oak tree in your yard or in your community garden, you're going to be creating so much life. Oak trees have pollen, they attract insects of every size, and the songbirds will uh, feed on all the insects in them. So they're really incredible plants. They also have um, oak moths that you'll see swarming them sometimes. And I've had questions about this, that uh, oak moths, oh, it's decimating my tree, you know, but I always like to remind people of the full, the full life cycle. It's like, okay, the oak moths move in, they eat all of, they transform the live oak material into compost, they drop the compost, and the tree comes back healthier the next year. So it's almost kind of like a hard prune that a gardener would do. So we love coast live oak and plant them as much as we can for wildlife. They're big, so you have to have the right space. Here is a red admiral butterfly and another west coast painted lady. And this one was taken in the Presidio very recently. This is a variable checker spot. It's taken by Megan and Rick Pralinger. And uh, this is a cool story because there were no variable checker spots in the Presidio. It's a very, um, it's a butterfly that likes, um, uh, when I'm, oh, scrub, scrub plants. So sticky monkey flower and bee plant. And uh, it's just a very low flying butterfly. So it doesn't like traffic, doesn't do well with cars, but it was not in the Presidio. They did a very successful restoration project where they relocated them from other natural areas. And now they're thriving and they're all over the Presidio. So it's a very exciting story to see. When you restore habitat, then you can start restoring the plants that depend on that habitat. 
Uh, this is another of our public spaces that Nature in the City is working hard on. This is Palou Phelps Park, which is a remnant wildflower grassland like Bernal Hill, Twin Peaks, many others in the city. This one has a real diversity of springtime plants and life. Uh, and it also has a lot of private space on it. It has spaces that are unaccessible at this point to build on, but they are privately owned. So we're re really working hard to save Palou Phelps from development, because if it does get developed, then about a third of the park will be lost and roads will be built up to the top and uh, wildflower, wildflower grassland is one of the most endangered uh, types of life that is you know, in the Northern United States because it was really easy to build on. And so whatever we can do in our city and beyond to restore, protect, and um, conserve places like this, we'll do. Here's the Palou Phelps Hill with our friends from the Natural Areas Program at Rec Park Department. And here's another wonderful public space that Nature in the City has been working on since 2013. This is Ada's Stairway. It's uh, at the edge of Buena Vista Park. And we know that the more you can expand our existing parks out with little fingers of habitat into the neighborhood, fingers or stepping stones, the better off and the more life you'll see. So we've planted hundreds of varieties of plants, some ornamental um, or some cultivated and a lot native. So we have sticky monkey flower, pearly everlasting, ceanothus, many plants that are thriving here. This is what it looked like before. So we had drug needles, trash, so much ivy. Uh, we had layers of cobblestone beneath the area because it was a cobblestone street. <laughs> People would drive up from Broderick and Waller up to Buena Vista Avenue East. You see a beautiful coast live oak tree at the top there. And this is what it looks like now. So we have beautiful hummingbird sage and seat monkey flower, irises, and uh, just so many native plants. This uh, bush tit was, photo was taken nearby in Buena Vista Park. It's using laundry, dryer lint, and plastic to make its uh, teardrop shaped nest. So, Wildlife finds a way, it really does. Here's Lauren Ada's stairway, Douglas Iris and California Lilac. Here's our scrub jay, loves yep. the oaks. Amber, can I yes. ask a, uh, another Amber? Oh yeah. Uh, asked a question, who is Ada's stairway named after? Oh, that's a great question. So I don't Ada, know either. <laughs> yeah. Ada Bakalinski. She is a really famous uh, icon in our city that promoted walkability and gathering. And uh, she wrote a book called The Staircase Walks of San Francisco, which is a great book to have in your library. And uh, the newer editions even highlight some of the, the tiled staircases. But uh, walking the staircases of San Francisco connects so many neighborhoods and, the hill and make the hilltops more accessible. So Ada Bakalinski is who the staircase was named for. Her daughter was able to get the city to dedicate the space in her honor. And at that time she was in her 90s, Ada, she's still alive. And she really um, just lit a fire under all of us in the neighborhood and asked nature in the city to participate. And that's how the project came about. Um, we see Very a lot of, nice. thank you. Yeah, we see a lot of ground nesting birds here at Ada's stairway. So this is a dark eyed junco nest. So we, we try to be really gentle with our walking through the space and we've created some borders of more prickly plants <laughs> along the outside. Uh, and we really try to create a lot of layering. So nesting, if you see nesting in your backyard, you have, you've just reached the pinnacle. <laughs> <laughs> of wildlife gardening. So nesting is one of those things that just lets you know you're doing it all right. So that can be really special. We also saw a couple of years where morel mushrooms came up at Ada's Stairway. So you have a place that's just decimated by neglect 
and then you start bringing life to it and surprises come. So we actually cooked these at home and made pasta. <laughs> and the other thing, we were sweeping up the staircase and under the leaves we found this guy, which is an arboreal salamander. We looked at it, we know that's not a slender salamander, which is very common in San Francisco. So we were really surprised and we put it on iNaturalist and we found it's an arbo arboreal salamander. And there are very few sightings of this, a couple around Buena Vista Park. But um, yeah, it's really exciting to see new life. And again, all thanks to volunteers who, you know, we can leverage our skills and knowledge and staff time with hundreds of people who are just willing to get out and do the work. So this was a group from Hands on Bay Area of young people that came to join us to work at Ada Stairway. And that's it. I am uh, complete with my talk, but I, um, those, that's the two websites. We have natureinthecity.org and wildsfgardening.com. And my, the two email addresses where you can reach out to us there. So I encourage you to take a screenshot or write them down and we're happy to connect with you. So Amber, that wonderful. Thanks so much. That's really inspiring. So can you tell us a little more about wildsfgardening.com? Is yeah. that your a landscape uh, yeah. design side of, of Nature in the City or a separate? Yeah, so it's a, we've, we've merged it into Nature in the City, so it's a project of Nature in the City. And uh, we offer gardening services there. At current, we're not visiting gardens yet. We have to rebuild our team a little bit because of the COVID public health emergency. But um, right now we're offering 30 minute free garden consultations and one and a half hour design sessions that we can work with you remotely to uh, really think about your space together and select the right plants and come up with a quick garden sketch to get you started on your own. And we will soon be going back into gardens and we do have a backlog of, <laughs> of uh, maintenance that we need to do for our current clients. So Wild SF Gardening is a great website where you can see examples of our work. And we do everything from consultation and design all the way to uh, installations and garden maintenance. And we're not a full landscape company, so we work with others to do things like hardscape and, you know, ponds and lawns and things. But we do gardening and plant, uh, plant guidance and plant care. And uh, we work with native plants and also uh, other plants that attract or cultivated plants that also provide uh, resources for wildlife. But our main focus is bringing more uh, diversity of life into your garden. Amber, I have a question. Thank you for the great presentation. It's nice to know that in this city, this built environment, this urban hardscape, that there is some nature left. We're about probably, I'd say about 90, 95% non-native plants here in between all the, the concrete. What can you say are some of the challenges of growing a native garden here in the city? And are the ch challenges the same for growing non-natives here? Uh, they're really different challenges. I think um, a lot of people have been told that they need to dig up their backyards and they need to add a lot of soil and they need to add a lot of fertilizer or they, um, so that is what you need to do if you're creating a, a cultivated garden because a lot of the plants that we bring in are from all over the world with different needs and soil types and some of them need a lot more fertilizer and soil amendments than what we have. Um, so the opposite is native plant gardening is, is getting clear on where you actually live and what your soil is like, whether you live you know, in Glen Park, where you have maybe higher groundwater table, or you live uh, in the Sunset District, where you have straight sand. So you're going to have a different set of plants that thrive there. But if you find the right assortment of plants, you can have a really easy garden, a really wonderful, full of life, easy garden. So um, I think the, uh, the challenge with native plants is just finding out what your soil type is, finding out what your right plant assortment is you know you might have a little bit of serpentine soil or you might have really rocky hard soil or you might have straight sand or you might have a combination of those 
And so that will give you a whole different plant palette. So one of them is much more like the cultivated gardening is much more intensive and you can plant anything you want. And the native gardening is, is much more passive, except you're doing a lot of weeding and trying to get a, a lot of those cultivated plants that have escaped out. Uh, but it's, you know, it's much more place-based. Yes, and there, there are a lot of challenges um, that I'm going to mention some when I give my garden walk today. And for me, it's learning what your yard is. Like you were saying, is it sand? Is it concrete that has been crushed and turned into a retaining wall with other construction debris? Um, what are the shadows like is a huge thing. You, you don't know, like you pick a time when I want to plant and, and your shadows at that time, your building may be blocked by the sun and you may think you're in a shady part, but it turns out eight months of the year, you're in a sunny part. So there's a lot of observations you have to make about your yard here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, uh, I think on the SF plant finder, there's a lot, there's some like a very easy, maybe a top 10 plants that will do almost will do well in almost any soil type and light condition. So that's a great place to start. SFplantfinder.com? SFplantfinder.org, maybe? .org, okay. Or try both, because I'm <laughs> not exactly sure. But yeah, that, that's a great resource. And um, yeah, also when you want to get into the more fine, fine details, you need to really think about your light conditions, like you said, and seasonality. Because... Uh, you know, when the light, when the sunlight gets really low and you have high, high trees, then you can have more winter sun than you would have. Then you'll have more summer shade because you have a tree canopy cover. So we found that out in a couple of places. Where do you go for inspiration for your plants? What are a couple of your favorite places to say, I want to see if a buckwheat can grow in my yard. Where do you want to see like what a mature buckwheat looks like? Well, uh, the Presidio, I think, has such an assortment of wonderful local habitats and just taking a walk through any of the you know lobos creek or you know just yeah any of the habitats uh, in the presidio is really wonderful i also like um, san pedro valley park in pacifica they have some just awesome like, huckleberry and wildflower fields uh, and then i like just going to places like twin peaks and um Glen Park is wonderful. I live in Noe Valley, so I think getting to know the natural areas in your neighborhood, and uh, I think during this time where we're all supposed to stay as close to home as possible, finding out where the natural areas are. Like I live really close to Billy Goat Hill, and what a treasure that is. Uh, and also, you could take a walk along the Crosstown Trail that uh, Nature in the City was part of, and learn about many different habitats along the way. So. Yeah, just learning the city in general will really help. And Amber, there, there's a few questions coming in. Okay. Um, uh, do you consult for yards in the East Bay? Uh, currently, we well, we we'd be happy to consult, but it's uh, it's really it's so interesting how different it is. I feel like I know a lot more about San Francisco's soil types and climate. So I would really recommend that you reach out to the, the Native Plant Society or um, the Berkeley Botanical Garden, find out other consultants that know, you know, closer to home. And I think the bringing back the Natives tour probably has some wonderful people just like me that they could recommend who would really know. These are the Native plants you go to, this, uh, Native plant nurseries you go to, this is what the soils like are, are like here. This is what your sunlight conditions are. <clears throat> so I would recommend uh, going as local as possible. There's a wonderful native plant nursery landscaper in uh, Oakland named Pete Valu at East Bay Wild. So if they go mm -hmm. to the East Bay Wilds website, they can find out more information there. Or if they're closer to Richmond, Watershed Nursery has an amazing collection of native plants. It's a good place to start too. And they could probably give you information as well as the East Bay chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Yeah. And another question uh, is, do you have any recommendations for when your backyard is 100% cement? And oh. uh, I think someone did uh, mention container gardens, which uh, 
we've actually used in our backyard to with native plants and certain native plants do very well in containers yeah. um also i wanted to mention to them i think that the sfpuc offers uh you know some kind of uh reward for uh removing the cement mm -hmm. but uh, i'm sure it doesn't offset the full cost but do you have any recommendations yeah <clears throat> take it out <laughs> no. um, but yeah it's it's actually a lot easier than you might think if you can start at an end and edge and go with a, a pry bar some of the concrete especially if it's old is really um, easy to remove if you can if, if you're a renter I totally understand that might not be possible and containers are a great way to go um, I would say bigger containers because a lot of native plants have deep roots and they don't they don't thrive well <clears throat> with small containers because they dry out really quickly and they don't their roots don't have enough place to grow. But there are I think the CNPS probably has some really wonderful resources for container garden for native plants. You can create so much habitat. My backyard is actually all concrete, and um, there's a lot of a lot of various size con size containers, wooden boxes. Uh, pots and and things and you can even ha hang things from walls if you have some fences and things you can do some vertical gardening yeah Annie's annual sells half wine barrels that you can get um, and I think mm -hmm. I think Bay Natives may also in the city here may also sell some containers they have some really unique containers that are great as does East Bay Wilds um, mm -hmm. I've had luck growing sheep burr Asina mm -hmm. uh, in my pot along with Dudlia, which is very easy and and those two are comfortable because they grow in rocky spaces so you want to look maybe in the wilds where things are comfortable squeezing into tight spaces like that mm -hmm. so the Dudlia, and then i sprinkle with annuals i've got some globe gilia growing in that one and that's given me flowers for like three months already of globe gilia annuals they're not going to be there the whole year but they recede and they'll yeah. come back next year also um the hummingbird uh flower sage. not the sage the um the, uh the uh, uh california yeah. yeah that one likes tight spaces too so that's a good one to put in containers yeah california fuchsia is great uh, because it's it can with, withstand dry environments too and um wax myrtle works pretty well and so does a uh, sticky monkey flower in containers all right, so um, there's uh, a question about uh, if you know ADA uh, appropriate locations for to mm. see natives. I can mention Heron's Head Park, a yeah. park that we've been involved in um, over in the Bayview is, is almost 100% native plants out there. So uh, that's a great place to go, especially in the afternoon when the sun's at your back. It's a nice and not the path out there is uh, nice and stable. Yeah. Also, the Visitation Valley Greenway has a native plant garden, and they have a, a really nice wide serpentine pathway that goes into it that I am pretty sure is ADA accessible. Uh, it's, it is a little steep, so you'll need to bring bring help probably, but <clears throat> it's a, that's a wonderful native plant garden with really established plants at this point. And if you're on the west side of town, you can go to Lobos Dunes mm -hmm. near Baker Beach and see a beautiful restoration. You're going to see lupin, buckwheat, seaside daisy, deerweed, which you don't get to see everywhere in the city. And it's a bee magnet. So that's a good place, too. It has a nice wide boardwalk. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Amber. This is, uh, like I say, you've been an inspiration for all of us. And, thank you uh, so much yeah there, there's some more questions coming in actually but perhaps uh you could uh take them offline really appreciate you being here thank yeah, you it's a great pleasure thank you guys so much i'm i'm excited to hear matt